Oh good, well welcome to Family Bible Time. It is this day. And this day is the day when we get to read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And then Psalm 86 and 122 as well. Um, but you're going to see Psalm 32. I, I, th I do believe that the whole English-speaking world has got it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, all, a few generations ago, almost everybody m memorized Psalm 23. I think they should have memorized Psalm 32. It would have done them a lot more good. Psalm 23 is a wonderful psalm of comfort for believers in the shepherding of the Saviour. Psalm 32 is David's testimony of how he repented when he had sinned. You could call it David's road, the, the road back to God from the dark paths of sin. And what a blessing this psalm has been to me and I know to many. So let's pray and we'll get stuck into it. You ready? Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, spiritual food day by day. Lord, we look to you because it comes from you. Please give us today our daily bread. Please feed us as we come to the end of the day. We pray that you would, <coughs> you would be with us and feed on and nourish our souls. And as others are starting their days, uh, listening to this, watching this, I pray that you would be with them. Pray that you would give them the strength and the courage and the faith that they need to face today. Lord, be with us all for your sake. Amen. Amen. Now, um, another way to give a title to this psalm is the blessedness of forgiveness. It's a masculine of David, and it begins with these wonderful words, blessed or truly enduringly happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In those first two verses, David has described for us the in almost inexplicable bliss, the wonder, the true wonder of actually being forgiven. This is the blessedness of forgiveness. This is the wonder of being right with God. But David hadn't been right with God. You know what he'd done uh, yesterday? We were studying... 2 Samuel 11 and 12 and 1 of Chronicles 20 or 21. Anyway, we were looking at the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah, adultery and murder. No, it was, it was uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Anyway... Now David's telling his testimony. Now David has repented finally and he's right with God again and he's happy again. We're going to hear in Psalm 51 about the reality that he'd lost his joy, the joy of his salvation. But in this psalm, he's, he's, he's now telling us what it was like. What is it like, by the way? What's it like when you just won't confess your sin? This is what it's like, as David describes it. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. That's, that's the experience of someone who's truly convicted of sin, which is the work of God, isn't it? Uh, and by the way, until you're really convicted of sin, you can't really say you've you've repented of it. If you're kind of if your reaction to your own sin is like, meh, yeah, I suppose I've sinned. Um, you can't say God the Holy Spirit has been working in you to convict you of your sin. That's just 
ridiculous. One of the first signs that someone is being saved is that they come under this conviction of sin, the seriousness, the weight of sin, and God is, God's hand is upon them. And that was David's experience. It was dreadful. He was groaning all day long because of his sin. Imagine that sighing and groaning and feeling terrible. Um, when does it change, by the way? When does that experience, that inner oppression from God because of our sin, when does that get relieved? <laughs> this is wonderful. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you. If you look at the Hebrew verb there, it means I'm, I was in the process of spelling out my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This is, again, we saw this just the other day, didn't we? Again, this is God. Oh, it was in my sermons in Daniel. This is God breaking in to David's prayer. David is confessing his sin. He's, he's in the process. He's going through it. He, he's, he's made a decision. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you could ask the question, how much is enough? How much confession is enough? Does, does our confession actually earn us forgiveness with God? Does God say, all right, you confess until you've confessed this much, and then I'll forgive you. God just broke into his, his confession with forgiveness. And that just shows that it's all by grace, isn't it? Now, at that point, David says, Selah, Selah. Think about this. By the way, if you want to think some more about this, if this is something which troubles you, if it's something which you need to dig into a little bit. I, I, I know a guy who preached a few sermons on Psalm 32. Oh yes, it was me. Um, there's a, I've, I've, it's been, this has been probably the one passage of scripture that I've preached most on because I just think this is the best psalm in the whole book. So if you want to go on the church website, and look up a sermon on this, you'll find probably a couple. How to be happy is one of them. Um, and you could, you could put the word again in there. How to be happy again. Anyway, therefore, says David. Now David's, remember he's telling his testimony? So this is David, he's repented. And now he's going to use what he's learned to help others. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Obviously, there's a time when God can be found and there's a day of salvation and none of us know when, when that will come to an end for us. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. There comes God's judgment. It's not going to get you if you're, if you're safe in God. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. This is what God does. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now here comes the counsel. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Don't be stubborn, says David. Come on, you, if you know you need to confess, now don't, don't be like a horse or a mule and you've got to have a bit stuck in your mouth and be pulled in if you're going to go the right way. Don't be stubborn. Don't, don't, this is David saying to people, saying to us, come on, repent. Mm. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. It's, it's, that's really true, isn't it? But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. He's saying, come on, don't, don't, be, don't be stubborn and suffer for it. But turn to the Lord and his chesed, his steadfast love, is going to surround you. Oh, can you imagine? Stop for a second. 
This is David. This is David who killed Uriah. This is David who stole Bathsheba. To the day of David's death, there is no way that he could forget what he did, is, is there? But what's his description of what it's like to be forgiven? This is what it's like. It's like being surrounded by steadfast love, chesed. You're going to read those words, steadfast love, one day, and you're going to be saying chesed, because your daddy said it so many times. Chesed. This is the loyal love. This is the covenant love. This is the settled, determined, unwavering love of God. And David says... When you trust in the Lord, it's like being surrounded by that. Wow. No wonder he says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Come on, says David. The water's fine. Come on in. <laughs> he, says, he says, come on, it's good here. For being forgiven is wonderful. There are joys. There are joys, oh, the joy of the Lord for everyone who's forgiven. I think this is the most amazing psalm. When you look at it and think that this is talking about David, it says to you, it says to you, it says to me, there is no one too bad to be forgiven. You have not sinned so much that this God cannot forgive you mm. the question is will you do what david did and go to him and beg for forgiveness mm. will you confess your sins will you spell them out to the lord will you not cover them up anymore will you will you will you go through them and and confess them and ask for forgiveness because if you will <laughs> he sent his son to die for sinners and he can save you completely. He can even save you in the middle of you confessing your sin to him and give you joy again. Mm. And David's saying it happened to me and it could happen to you. I'm saying it happened to me and it could happen to you too. <laughs> and that's the experience of every Christian. How wonderful. Uh, and I just want to say this as well. All the time you keep silent, all the time you won't confess your sin, you cannot have this. All the time you refuse to confess your sins, you can't have the, the real forgiveness and the real joy of the Lord that God gives. It's there for you. It's, it's there, but it's for those who confess their sins. And for those who, who find salvation through Christ. Um, David adds this little stinger in verse 2, doesn't he? He says, Blessed, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no... What's the word? Deceit, deceit. There are a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord, but they're not interested in doing what Jesus said. And he called them, didn't he? There are a lot of people who say, oh yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but it's all just words. It has to be the real thing. You have to actually confess your sins to God and not cover up anymore. No more pretense. There can't be deceit. There can't be pretense. There cannot be hypocrisy and this joy. But if you will truly repent and truly confess, hypocrisy is when, you, when you're saying I'm following Christ, but you're not really confessing and forsaking your sin. You can't have it. No, and not until you actually come to the Lord for it. Well, that's just Psalm 32. Now, how would you like to hear David's repentance? Psalm 51 Psalm 32 is, is the testimony 
of David's repentance. Now Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the poetic expression of his repentance. This is awesome. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, though, is check that this is still recording, because I don't want to... Remember it cut us off that time. Yeah, it's still going. I've no idea how to see whether it will just keep going or not, but there we are. Yeah, we're using a new camera, which is why you can actually see us in focus, hopefully. <laughs> it does mean we've got to be a little bit more careful about whether I shave or not and things like that. Anyway, to the choir master, a psalm of David. This is David's psalm of repentance. I, I believe, I mean, it says here, when, David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this is David's expression of repentance at that point. Whether it's written after the event, or whether this is what... I mean, in, in, in the account in 2 Samuel 12, David just says, I've sinned against the Lord. This is what he was doing when he was confessing his sin. Psalm 32 is he's saying, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord um, and I will not cover my iniquity. This is actually David doing that. So you want to see what does it look like? And then Now this is poetry. This is like Hebrew poetry is all balanced. It's, it's not rhymed like English poetry but it's balanced in, and the, the lines are paralleled with each other in their thought structure. And it's quite possible that David just spat these lyrics um, straight out, inspired by the Holy Spirit, because, you know, some, sometimes rap artists can just, they can just speak spoken word poetry extemporaneously and, and I think it's possible that David just came out with this there and then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit but anyway be that as it may here goes David's repentance and confession of sin can you stop fiddling with that cushion please young lady <laughs> here we go verse one have mercy on me O God According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So up to now, David's been saying, look, okay, He's just pleading for mercy. He's pleading on the basis of God's steadfast love in verse 1. He's asking for washing, for cleansing. He's saying, look, this is, this is a terribly serious situation. I, I have to have mercy or I'm done for. He's, he's confessing that his sins are against God, verses 3 and 4. My sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned. And he's saying, God, you're right to punish me so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He's saying, now, I, I was born in sin. I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. And he's saying, look, you want me to be honest about my sin. You, you delight in truth in the in inward being. I need, I, need to, I need to fess up at this point, says David, and I, I am not going to hide it. 
Now, that's just a good beginning. <laughs> he gets going in verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And I think if you can look at that verse 7 down to verse 12, is one of the most amazing cries for forgiveness that you could you could have. So he's he's saying, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was the plant that they dipped in the blood um, to spread the blood of the Passover sacrifice on the doorposts and on the lintels of the door. Um, he he is the hyssop was the plant that they used like a brush to sprinkle the blood on the on the uh, altar and on the people and and so this is this is David saying lord i need to be cleansed with the with the blood of sacrifice and and i need to be washed washed wash me and i shall be whiter than snow and he's saying you can blot out my iniquities i need you god to fix the problem of my sin this is the opposite opposite of saying I will be good from now on it's the opposite of saying I'll do better Lord please be patient with me I'll, I'll, I'll improve myself I'll earn your respect I'll, I'll do good things and then and then you'll be pleased with me this is him saying I've sinned and I need to be forgiven until you've come to God like this you've never really come to God and here's another element of it. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. He wants, his, he wants cleansing at the deepest level. Renew a right spirit within me. He's saying, look, I'm wrong at the deepest level. There's something wrong inside me that I could want to do something like that. Lord, you've got to change that. He's looking for that change at, at, at the deepest level. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. By the way, a true believer cannot lose the indwelling of the Holy Spirit um, in, the New, in New Testament times. But I think David's focused on not losing the Spirit of God upon him as the king, as Saul had done. You remember God took away his Holy Spirit from Saul. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. God want, David wants God to deal with him on the inside so that he is willing. Do you, do you ever find yourself unwilling to do what God wants you to do? David's asking for that to be changed. Then he says in verse 13, then, in other words, Lord, when you change me on the inside, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. He's not afraid to name his own murder, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God. You will not despise. Our generation, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, will try to fix your broken and contrite heart. God says that's a good thing. You should not be you should not be 
ashamed to be broken. You should be ashamed not to be broken. You, 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 should, not be a, you should not be embarrassed about being contrite and having sins play on your mind. You should be utterly, utterly embarrassed that you're not more ashamed of your sin. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise because God sees it and God cares for that. Uh, this is really interesting. The end of the psalm, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. It's really interesting to me that David finishes this whole prayer of repentance, not with another prayer for himself, but with a prayer for the people of God. And that's a very, very good example. All right, we must move on. Psalm 86. I've spent a lot of time on those too. But I think that's not a bad thing, is it? If this is the beginning of your day, I hope it's a good start. I am just going to check that this is still going. <laughs> we had a problem with it cutting off. And it is still going. Hello. Good. All right, we'll get into this. You want me to go back and check again? I didn't hear what you said. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Say, preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. Oh, what's that word? Chesed. Chesed, yes. Abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my pleas for grace. In the time of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, but they do not set you before them. And they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favour that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, O oh, you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. I love this psalm. I love this psalm. I, I think um, one of the struggles we have is when it comes to repenting, we struggle because we have harsh views of God. So you say, well, I've, ter I've sinned terribly. How can I go to God now? How can I... Are you worried about something? The duck was just starting to make a racket. Oh, okay. You say, you say how, can I, 
how can I go to God after I've sinned so terribly? God sees all my sin. He knows all my sin. How can I come to him about it? Well, here's how. Look at verse 5 again. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. So, so that's that's the explanation. What's the what's what's what is it that he based on that? But the previous verse: For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. So he's going to God. He's praying to God. Why? How can David pray? Because, oh, you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. There was a preacher once who went to visit an old lady. And he said, are you, and she was nearly dead, nearly, or at least she was dying. And he said, are you, are you, Ready to meet your maker? Are you ready to meet your judge? Have you repented? And her re- re- reply was so interesting. Oh, yes, she said. I, it's a long time since I took God at his word. And that was the way she used to describe what it means to trust God. You're taking him at his word. So... God says in his word about himself that he is abounding, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, and he's a forgiving and gracious God, right? He says that again and again. Now, this is David taking God at his word and saying, okay, well, I'm going to pray to you and ask for forgiveness because you are good and you are forgiving God And you abound in chesed, in steadfast love, to who? What does it say, verse 5? Say it loud. Come on. All who call upon you. So, So that would include you, right? So if you call upon the Lord... If you call upon the Lord, just no matter what you've done, if you cry to him, this is how God will be to you. Mm. Guaranteed, based on the words of this psalm. Praise God. Psalm 122. Don't you love the psalms? I hope you love the psalms. A song of ascents. Oh, when did they sing the songs of ascents? He says, winking at his daughter. When did they sing the songs of ascents? Oh, yes, on their way up to Jerusalem when they were on their pilgrimage. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, that their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Now this is a a verse for today, isn't it? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. On Sunday, I'm going to be preaching a sermon, and I'm going to call it The Future for the Jews. God's plans for the Jews for the future. We're we're working our way through Daniel, 
And we're in chapter nine. Oh yes. No, I've been thinking about it all week and a fair bit today. But I'm going to preach this sermon and it's going to be called the, the Future for the Jews or God's Plan for the Future for the Jews or something like that. I've written it down somewhere. Um, the titles, the exact title is not important. The idea is really important because in Daniel chapter 9, God spells out the future for your people in verse 24. For your people, he says, 70 weeks are decreed. For your, uh, 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 about your people and your holy city. What's the holy city of David? Jerusalem. And that prophecy actually tells us about some of the future of Jerusalem and the future for the people of David, the Jews. But this is interesting. Right now there are rockets flying in Jerusalem and in Israel and uh, the terrorists are terrorizing the, the Jews who are still resisting their God and rejecting their God despite claiming to follow their God. They're, they're still rejecting Jesus, their Messiah. But, you know, in the future that will be different. And I pray for that. Do you pray for that? Do you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Do you pray for salvation for the Jews? Um, I, I find the more I read this book, the more I love that city, the more I love those people, the Jews, the more I long for God to keep his, his promises to them and to save them and to just see them blessed in the way that he said he would bless them. So for my brothers and companions sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Father, we pray that you'd bless our reading of your word today, that you'd feed our souls, that you'd even save some who are listening to this. Help your children to return to you like David did. Help us to find and know and never lose the joy of your salvation. Thank you for your abundant mercy and your amazing forgiveness. Thank you that you've put it here for us in your word to give us hope. Help everyone who's hearing these words to trust in you, to take you at your word and find your peace. We ask for Jesus' sake. And we do pray that you would have mercy upon your city, Jerusalem that you'd have mercy upon your people there, that you would save them, that you would bring them true and everlasting peace. And we know that they will have to go through many, many turbulent times, but we beg you to use it to bring them peace. We pray now that you would protect them and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. We are done and we can't I can't ask you to stop it now. Ah oh.